What's up, y'all? <laughs> that was dry. What I meant to say was Happy Black History Month. It is February 7th, so we are seven days into Black History Month. And that means I have to give you a wonderful short story from the Harlem Renaissance. Because we celebrate black excellence around here. You feel me? So today's story time is going to be Six Gilded Bits by Zora Neale Hurston. And I've never read it. So we are discovering a story together. How exciting. Um, before we get started, you know, I got to shamelessly promote myself as I do, as I see. So if you don't know who I am, I'm Brianka J, your host. And I want to thank you for visiting my little corner of the internet. It is always a pleasure to have you join me. I am a writer by trade. I have three books out, two children's books and one ebook about mastering your online sales. I also have my own small web design agency. This agency allows me to help small businesses create global empires using an online presence. If you have a small business or are interested in opening one yourself, then you should totally contact me. I am excited to see your growth and to partner with you in helping to bring your vision to life. Without further ado, let's get into this short story. It's going to be a little cold in here. Grab yourself some coffee. Grab yourself some tea. Let's go. The Gilded Six Bits, Zornel Hurston. It was a Negro yard around a Negro house and a Negro settlement that looked to the payroll of the G and G Fertilizer Works for support. But there was something happy about the place. The front yard was parted in the middle by a sidewalk from gate to doorstep. A sidewalk edged on either side by quart bottles driven neck down into a ground on a slant. A mess of homey flowers planted without a plan, but blooming cheerily around their helter-skelter places. The fence and house were whitewashed. The porch and steps scrubbed white. The front door stood open to the sunshine so that the floor of the front room could finish drying after its weekly scouring. It was Saturday. Everything cleaned from the front gate to the privy house. Yard raked so that the strokes of the rake would make a pattern. Fresh newspaper cut and fancy edge on the kitchen shelves. Missy May was bathing herself in the galvanized wash tub in the bedroom. Her dark brown skin glistened under the soap suds that skittered down from her wash rag. Her stiff young breasts thrust forward aggressively, like broad based cones with the tips lacquered in black. She heard men's voices in the distance and glanced at the dollar clock on the dresser. Hmm. Um, way behind my time today. Joe going to be here before I get my clothes on if I don't make haste. She grabbed the clean meal sack at hand and dried herself hurriedly and began to dress. But before she could tie her slippers, there came the ring of singing metal on wood nine times. Missy May grinned with delight. She had not seen the big tall man come stealing in the gate and creep up the walk, grinning happily at the joyful mischief he was about to commit. But she knew that it was her husband throwing silver dollars in the door for her to pick up and pile beside her plate at dinner. It was this way every Saturday afternoon. The nine dollars hurled into the open door. He scurried to a hiding place behind the Cape Jasmine bush and waited. Missy May promptly appeared at the door in mock alarm. Who that chucking money in my doorway? She demanded. No answer from the yard. She leaped off the porch and began to search the shrubbery. She peeped under the porch and hung over the gate to look up and down the road. While she did this, the man beside the jasmine darted to the china berry tree. She spied him and gave him chase. Nobody ain't going to be chucking money at me and ain't not do me nothing, she shouted in mock anger. He ran around the house with Missy May at his heels. She overtook him at the kitchen door. He ran inside but could not get close enough after him before she cr crowded in and locked it with him in a rough and tumble. For several minutes, the two were a furious mass of male and female energy, shouting, laughing, twisting, turning, tussling, tickling each other in the ribs. 
Missy May clutching onto Joe and Joe trying, but not too hard, to get away. Missy May, take your hand out my pocket, Joe shouted out between laughs. I ain't, Joe. Not letting you get, give me, go on, give me whatever it is you got in your pocket. Turn it, go, Joe. Do all your tear your clothes. Go on, tear them. You the one put past you these needles around here. Move your hand, Missy May. Let me get that paper sack out your pocket. I bet it's candy kisses. Tank, move your hand. Woman ain't got no business in a man's clothes, no how. Go away. Missy May gouged way down and gave an upward jerk and triumphed. Uh-huh, I got it. It is so candy kisses. I know you had something for me in your clothes. Now I got to see what's in every pocket you got. Joe smiled indulgently and let his wife go through all of his pockets and take out the things they had hidden for her to find. She bore off the chewing gum, the cake of sweet soap, the pocket handkerchief as if she had wrested them from him, as if they had not been bought for the sake of this friendly battle. Woo that play fight and got me all warmed up, Joe explained. Got me some water in the kettle. Your water is on the fire and your clean things across the bed. Hurry up and wash yourself and get changed so we can eat. I'm hungry. Ah, Missy said, said this. She bore the steaming kettle into the bedroom. You ain't hungry, sugar, Joe contradicted her. You just a little empty. I'm the one that's hungry. I could eat up camping, meeting, back off association, and drink Jordan dry. Have it on the table when I get out the tub. Don't you mess with, me, with my business, man. You get in your clothes. I'm a real wife, not no dressing breath. I might not look like one, but if you burn me, you won't get a thing but wife's ashes. Blows, Joe splashed in the bedroom, and Missy May fanned around in the kitchen. A fresh red and white checkered cloth on the table. Big picture of buttermilk beaded with pale drops of butter from the churn. Hot fried mullet. Crackling bread, ham hock atop a mound of string beans and new potatoes, and perch on the windowsill a pone of spicy potato pudding. Very little talk during the meal, but that little consisted of banter that pretended to defi deny affection, but in reality flaunted it. Like when Missy May reached for a second helping of the tater pone. Joe snatched it out of her reach. After Missy May had two or three unsuccessful grabs at the pan, she begged, Ah, oh, Joe, give me some more potato pone. Nope, sweetening is for us men folks. Y'all pretty little frail ill don't need nothing like this. You too sweet already. Please, Joe. Nah, nah. I don't want you to get no sweeter than what you is already. We're going down the road a little piece tonight, so you go put on your Sunday ghost meat and things. Missy May looked at her husband to see if he was playing some prank. Show sure enough, Joe? Yeah, we're going down to the ice cream parlor. Where the ice cream parlor at, Joe? A new man didn't come here from Chicago. He didn't got a place and took and opened it up for an ice cream parlor. And being, as it's a real swell, I want you to be one of the first ladies to walk in there and have some set down. Do Jesus, I ain't know nothing about it. Who the man done it? Mr. Otis D. Slimmons of Spots and Places, Memphis, Chicago, Jacksonville, Philadelphia, and so on. That heavy set man with his mouth full of gold teeth? Yeah, where'd you see him at? I went down to the store to get a box of law and I saw him standing on the corner to some of them men's. And I come on back and went to scrubbing the floor and he passed and tipped his hat whilst I was scoring the steps. I thought I'd never seen him before. Joe smiled pleasantly. Yeah, he's up to date. He got the finest clothes I've ever seen on a colored man's back. Ah, uh, he don't look no better in his clothes than you do in your He got a puzzle gut on him. And so chucklehead, he got a poem behind his neck. Joe looked down to his own abdomen and said wistfully, Wish I had a build on me like he got. He ain't puzzle gutted, honey. He just got a corporation. That, that make him look like a rich white man. All rich white men that got some belly on him. I didn't. I seen the pictures of Henry Ford, and here he's a spare built man. And Rockefeller looked like he ain't got but one gut. But Ford and Rockefeller and his lemons and all the rest of can be as many gutted as they please. I satisfied with you just like you is, baby. God took pattern after a pine tree and built you noble. You's a pretty man, and if I know any way to make you more pretty, I still take you and do it. 
Joe reached over gently and tore with Miss May, Missy May's ear. You just say that because you love me, but I know you. I can't hold no light to Otis D. Simmons. I ain't never been nowhere, and I ain't got nothing but you. Missy May got on his lap and kissed him, and he kissed, and he kissed back in kind. Then he went on. All the women is crazy about him everywhere he go. How you know that, Joe? He told us so himself. That don't make it so. His mouth is cut crossways, ain't it? Well, he can't lie just like anybody else. Good Lord, Missy. You woman show is too hard to sense into things. He got a $5 gold piece for a stick pen. He got a $10 gold piece on his watch chain. And his mouth is jammed. It's just crammed full of gold teeth. Show sure wish it was mine. And what make it so cool? He got money accumulated. And women give it all to him. I don't see what the women see on him. I wouldn't give him a wink if he, if, if the sheriff was after him. Well, he told us how the white women in Chicago give him all that gold money. So he don't allow nobody to, to touch it at all. Not even put their finger on it. They told him to it. You can make a miration at it. But don't touch it. Why did he stay up there since they so crazy about him? I reckon that it made him vast rich and he wants to travel some. He said they wouldn't leave him hit a lick of work. He got more lady people crazy about him than he can shake a stick at. Joe, I hate to see you so dumb. That straight nigga just tell y'all anything and y'all believe it. Go head on now, honey, and put on your clothes. He's talking about this pretty women that I want him to see mine. Missy May went off the dress and Joe spent the time trying to make his stomach punch out like slim in the middle. He tried the swelling swagger of the stranger but found that his tall bone and muscle stride fitted ill with it. He just had time to drop back into his seat before Missy May came in dressed to go. On the way home that night, Joe was exalted. Didn't I say old Otis was swell? Can't he talk Chicago talk? Wasn't that funny what he said when he great big fat old Ida Armstrong come in? He asked me. Who is that broad with the 40 shake? That's a new word. Us always thought 40 was a set of figures. But he showed us where it means a whole heap of things. Sometimes he don't say 40. He, say, he just say 38 and 2. And that means the same thing. Know what he told me when I was playing for our ice cream? He said, I have to hand it to you, Joe. That wife of yours is just 38 and 2. Yes, and she 40. Ain't he killing? He'll do in case of a rush, but he sure is got up a, he a, a, a heap of gold on him. That's the first time I ever seen gold money. It looked good on him for sure enough, but it looked a whole heap better on you. Who, me? Missy May, you was crazy. Where would a poor man like me get gold money from? Missy May was silent for a minute. Then she said, Us might find some along the road sometime, us could. Who would be losing gold money around here? We ain't even seen none of these white folks wearing no gold money on their watch change. You must be figuring Mr. Packard or Miss Cadillac gonna pass through here. You don't know what been lost around here. Maybe somebody, some, maybe somebody way back in more Memorial time thought they gold money. And went on off and it ain't never been found. If this, and if we was to find it, you could wear some about without having no gang of women like that Simmons that he got. Joe laughed and hugged her. Don't be so wishful about me. I'm satisfied the way I is. So long as I be your husband, I don't care about nothing else. I'd rather all the other women in the world to be dead than for you to have to have a toothache. Let's we go to bed and get our, let's go to bed and get our night's nice rest. It was Saturday night once more. Joe could parade his wife in Slimmon's ice cream parlor again. He worked the night shift and Saturday was his only night off. Every other evening around 6 o'clock he left home and dying Don saw him hustling home around the lake while a challenging sun flung a flaming sword from east to west across the trembling water. That was the best part of life, going home to Missy May. Their whitewashed house, the Mac mock battle on Saturday, their dinner and ice cream parlor afterwards, Church on Sunday nights when Missy outdressed any woman in town, all everything was right. One night around 11, the acid rain out in, at the G&G, &G, the former knocked off the crew and let the steam die down. As Joe rounded the lake on his way home, a lean moon rolled the lake in a silver boat. 
If anybody had asked Joe about the moon on the lake, he would have said he hadn't paid any attention. But he saw it with his feelings. It made him yearn painfully for Missy. Crea creation obsessed him. He thought about children. They had been married for more than a year now. They had money put away. They ought to be making little feet for shoes. A little boy would be about right. He saw a dim light in the bedroom and decided to come in through the kitchen door. He could wash the fertilizer dust off himself before pres presenting himself to Missy May. It would be nice for her to not to know that he was there until he slipped into his place in bed and hugged her back. She always liked that. He eased the kitchen door open, slowly and silently, but when he went to set his dinner bucket on the table, he bumped it into a pile of dishes and something crashed to the floor. He heard his wife gasp in fright and hurried to reassure her. It's me, honey. Don't get scared. There was a quick, large movement in the bedroom. A rustle, a thud, and a stealthy silence. The light went out. What? Robbers? Murderers? Some varmint attacking his helpless wife, perhaps? He struck a match, threw himself on guard, and stepped over the door sill into the bedroom. The great belt on the wheel of time slipped and eternity stood still. By the match light, he could see the man's legs fighting with his britches and his frantic desire to get them on. He had both chance and time to kill the intruder in his helpless condition, half in and half out of his pants, but he was too weak to take action. The shapeless enemies of humanity live in the hours of time had waylaid Joe. He was assaulted in his weakness, like Samson awakening after his haircut, so he just opened his mouth and laughed. The match went out and he struck another and lit the lamp. A howling wind raced across his heart. But underneath his fury, he heard his wife sobbing and Slimmons pleading for his life, offering to buy it with all he had. Please, sir, don't kill me. $62 at the store. Gold money. Joe just stood. Slimmons looked at the window, but it was screened. Joe stood out like a rough-backed mountain between him and the door, barring him from escape, from sunrise, from life. He considered a surprise attack upon the big clown that stood there laughing like a cheesy cat. But before his fist could travel an inch, Joe's own rushed out to crush him like a battering ram. Then Joe stood over him. Get into your damn rag, Slimmons, and that quick. Slimmons scrambled to his feet into his vest and coat. As he grabbed his hat, Joe's fury overrode his intentions, and he grabbed at Slimmons with his left hand and struck at him with his right. The right landed. The left grazed the front of his vest. Slimmons was knocked a somersault into the kitchen and fled from the fled through the open door. Joe found himself alone with Missy May with, with the golden watch charms clutched in his left fist. A short bit of broken chain dangled between his fingers. Missy May was sobbing, wells of weeping without words. Joe stood and after a while he found out that he had something in his hand. And then he stood and felt without thinking and without seeing with his natural eyes. Missy May kept on crying and Joe kept on feeling so much and not knowing what to do with all his feelings. He put Slimmon's watch charm in his pants pocket and took a good laugh and went to bed. Missy May, what you crying for? Because I love you so hard and I know you don't love me no more. Joe sank his face into the pillow for a spell. Then he said huskily, You don't know the feelings of that yet, Missy May. Oh, Joe, honey. He said he was going to give me that gold money. He just kept on after me. Joe was very still and silent for a long time. Then he said, well, don't cry no more, Missy May. I got your gold piece for you. The hours went past on their, on their rusty ankles. Joe still and quiet on one bed rail, and Missy May wrung dry of sobs on the other. Finally, the sun's tide crept upon the shore of night and drowned all its hours. Missy May, with her face stiff and streaked toward the streaked towards the window, saw the dawn come into her yard. It was day, nothing more. Joe wouldn't be coming home as usual. No need to fling open the front door and sweep off the porch, making it nice for Joe. Never no more breakfast to cook. No more washing and starching of Joe's jumper jackets and pants. No more nothing. So why get up? With this strange man in her bed, she felt embarrassed to get up and dress. She decided to wait till he had dressed and gone. 
Then she would get up, dress quickly, and be gone forever beyond the reach of Joe's looks and laughs. But he never moved. Red light turned to yellow, then white. From beyond the no man's land, between them came a voice, a strange voice that yesterday had been Joe's. Missy Mae, ain't you going to fix me no breakfast? She sprang out of bed. Yeah, Joe, I didn't reckon you was hungry. No need to die today. Joe needed for her for a few more minutes anyhow. Soon there was ro- roaring a soon there was a roaring fire in the cook stove. Water bucket full, full and two chickens killed. Joe loved fried chicken and rice. She didn't deserve a thing and, and good Joe was letting her cook him some breakfast. She rushed hot bixits to the table as Joe took his seat. He ate with his eyes and his plate. No laughter, no banter. Missy May, you ain't eating your breakfast. I don't choose none. I thank you. His coffee cup was empty. She sprang to refill it. When she turned from the stove and bent to set the cup beside Joe's plate, she saw the yellow coin on the table between them. She slumped into her seat and wept into her arms. Presently, Joe said calmly, Missy May, you cry too much. Don't look back like Lot's life and turn to salt. The son, the hero of every day, the impersonal old man that beamed as brightly on death as on earth, came up every morning and raced across the blue dome and dipped into the sea of fire every morning. Water ran downhill and birds nested. Missy knew why she didn't leave Joe. She couldn't. She loved him too much. But she could not understand why Joe didn't leave her. He was polite, even kind at times, but aloof. There were no more Saturday romps. No ringing silver dollars to stack beside her table. Her plate, sorry. No pockets to rifle. In fact, the yellow coin in his trousers was like a monster hiding in the cave of his pockets to destroy her. She often wondered if he still had it. But nothing could have inducted her to ask, nor yet to explore his pockets to see for herself. His shadow was in the house, whether or no. One night, Joe came home around midnight and complained of pains in the back. He asked Missy to rub him down with liniment. It had been three months since Missy had touched his body, and it all seemed strange. But she rubbed him, grateful for the chance. Before morning, youth triumphed and Missy exulted. But the next day, as she joyfully made up their bed, beneath her pillow she found the piece of money with the bit of chain attached. Alone to herself, she looked at the thing with loathing. But look, she must. She took it into her hands with trembling and saw first thing that it was no gold piece. It was a gilded half dollar. Then she knew why Slimmons had forbidden anyone to touch his gold. He trusted village eyes at a distance not to recognize his stick pen as a gilded quarter and his watch charm as a four bit, bit piece. She was glad at first that Joe had left it here. Perhaps he was through with her punishment. They were man and wife again. Then on another night, thought came clawing at her. He had come home to buy from her as if she were any woman in the long house. Fifty cents for her love. As if to say that he could pay as well as lemons. She slid the coin into his Sunday pants pocket and dressed herself and left his house. Halfway between her house and the quarter, she met her husband's mother. And after a short talk, she turned and went back home. Never would she admit defeat to that woman who prayed for it nightly. If she had not the substance of marriage, she had the the outside show. Joe must leave her. She let him see she didn't want his old gold for a bit too. She saw no more of the coin for some time, though. She knew that Joe could not help finding it in his pocket. But his health kept poor, and he came home at least every 10 days to be rubbed. The sun swept around the horizon, trailing its robes of weeks and days. One morning, as Joe came in from work, he found Missy May chopping wood. Without a word, he took the axe and chopped a huge pile before he stopped. You ain't got no business chopping wood and you know it. How come? I've been chopping it for the last longest. I ain't blind. You making feet for shoes. Won't you be glad to have a little baby child, Joe? 
You know that thou ain't. You know that thou ain't sent me. It's going to be a boy child in every spit of you. You reckon, Missy May? Who else could it look like? Joe said nothing, but he threw his hand deep into his pocket and fingered something there. It was almost six months later. Missy May took to bed, and Joe went in and got his mother to come and wait at the house. Missy May was delivered of a fine boy. Her trivial was over when Joe came in, come in from work one morning. His mother and the old woman were drinking great bowls of coffee around the fire in the kitchen. The minute Joe came into the room, his mother called him aside. How did Missy May make out? He asked quickly. Who that gal? She's strong as an ox. She's going to have plenty more. We done fixed her with the sugar and the lard and sweeten her for the next one. He stood silent a while. You ain't asked about the baby, Joe. You ought to be mighty proud because he showed us a spitting image of your son. That's urine, all right. Eat if you never get another one. That, that one is urine. And you know I'm mighty proud too, son. Because I never thought well of you marrying Missy May. Because her mom used to fan her foot round right smart. And I've been mighty scared that Missy May was going to get misput on her road. Joe said nothing. He fooled around the house till late in the day. Then just before he went to work, he went and stood at the foot of the bed and asked his wife how she felt. He did this every day during the week. On Saturday, he went to Orlando to make his market. It had been a long time since he had done that. Meat and lard, meal and flour, soap and starch, cans of corn and potatoes, all the staples. He fooled around town for a while and bought bananas and apples. Way after a while, he ran around to the candy store. Hello, Joe, the clerk greeted him. I ain't seen you in a long time. Nope, I ain't been here. Been round in spots and places. Want some of those molasses kits that you always buy? Yes, sir. He threw the gilded half dollar on the counter. Will that spin? What is it, Joe? Well, I'll be dong gone. A gold-plated four-bit piece. Where'd you get it, Joe? Off on a stray nigga that came through Edenville. He had it on his watch chain for a charm, going around making out his gold money. Huh. <laughs> he had a quarter on his tipping, and it was good. All it was all golded up, too, trying to fool people. Making out he's so rich and everything. Hmm, <laughs> Trying to tell off folks' wives from home. How did you get it, Joe? Did he fool you, too? Who, me? Nah, sir. He ain't fooled me none. Not what I done. He come around me with his smart talk. I hauled off and knocked him down and took his old four bits away from him. Going to buy my wife some gold old last kisses with him. Give me 50 cents worth of them candy kisses. 50 cents buys a mighty lot of candy kisses, Joe. Why don't you split it up and make some chocolate bars, too? They eat good, too. Yes, sir, they do. But I wants all that in kisses. I got a little boy child home now. Tain't a week old yet, but he can suck a sugar tit and maybe eat one of them kisses himself. Joe got his candy and left the store. The clerk turned to the next customer. Wish I could be like these darkies laughing all the time. Nothing worries them. Back in Edenville, Joe reached his own front door. There was a ring of singing metal on wood, 15 times. Missy May couldn't run to the door, but she crept there as quickly as she could. Joe Banks, I hear you chunking money in my doorway. You wait till I get my strength back, and I'm going to fix you for that. That was so cute. Oh, my God. So that was written in 1933 by Miss Zora Neil Hurston. I love that he forgived her forgived look it's the colloquialism of the story got me talking crazy i love that he forgave her in the end what a beautiful like ending i was really happy that the baby was joe's because girl no that was a scary moment right there what did y'all think about her sleeping with mr slimmons and then what did you think about his fake ass money it's interesting points. I want to know what you guys think about the story. And, um, yeah, let's talk about it. And I'll see you in the comments. You know, I love to talk to y'all in the comments section. Yeah, so um, if you like the story, please comment, like, and subscribe. I don't know. Story, story got me all up in here right now. But if you like the story and you want to see more stories like this, please like, comment, and subscribe for more. And I'll be back with more great stories from the Harlem Renaissance for the whole month of February. See you soon.